on virtual prizes and awards evening, uh, which I very much hope will be the very last virtual prizes and awards evening that we host, uh, and that we can all see you face to face uh, next year, where we'll actually have some some drinks and some nibbles. Um, but thank you so much for joining us through Teams this evening. Um, I'm just going to kick uh, straight off and introduce you straight away to Ken Grattan, the chair of the Prizes and Awards Committee, who's going to start by saying a few words. Uh, thank you, Steph, and good, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, annual Prizes and Awards evening of the Institute of Measurement and Control. Uh, this, as Steph has said, is the second year, and uh, I think we all hope very much the last. Um, when uh, it'll be a virtual only event. Uh, tonight uh, is one of the major days in the Institute's calendar, and it's one when you get the opportunity to reward excellence, uh, both from within the Institute itself and uh, across the wider community. And as I hope that you'll see from the prizes and awards that are given out this evening, uh, these prizes recognize work in various fields of measurement and control, as well as long and distinguished service to the Institute itself. And I think tonight very much is no exception to that. I think as well, I hope what we'll be able to demonstrate is that uh, the Institute is not just a UK, but uh, an organisation with global reach. And the measurement and control that uh, is recognised tonight uh, is um, measurement and control that covers a wide spectrum of innovative science and engineering that's used and developed across the world. So at the outset, let me uh, take the opportunity to congratulate our, all our prize winners. Um, every year uh, working across the committee, it's uh, a harder job uh, selecting from amongst a group of excellent nominations. And uh, th this year was, was no exception to that. So again, well done everyone. So let me hand back again then to, uh, to Seth Smith. Uh, to, in to uh, introduce uh, the Institute's president uh, to say a few words, and then I'll come back uh, a little bit later. Steph, over to you. Thanks, Ken. OK, so now I'm going to pass um, over to our president, uh, Mr. Martin Belshaw, um, who's going to say a few words about this evening's event. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Back in January uh, 2019, I envisaged a busy couple of years uh, and a hectic program and complicated travel arrangements. I was for sure expecting some challenges. We have had and survived a few in recent years, but I was not expecting a global public health catastrophe to be one of them or the demise of the oil and gas business for the second time. And I did not envisage doing all of this via video either, also for the second time. I guess time will tell as survival mode and remote working seems to have been working quite well. We have now gotten good at it, used to it and whatever normal was forgotten about that. However, in all of this mess, I also believe there has been some opportunities for new work, new ways of working and the ever evasive new normal, whatever that is. Never so true, the old adages adapt and survive and the early bird gets the worm. And my own particular favourite, the great thing about chaos is every step is in the right direction. We set our sights miles ahead, not just a few weeks or months, cleared our diaries so we could understand the real problems, execute real fixes, and these were challenges definitely. The Institute brings together and represents engineers across both industry and academia to influence future technological developments. And similarly, it has input to government policy through papers, advisory groups and manifestos to hopefully see right done. Membership of a PEI is still essential to career development and it provides opportunities for networking and professional recognition among peers and further afield. At the InstMC, we provide a national network of local sections to facilitate this. It is particularly important for younger engineers to develop, learn, interact and raise their personal profile. And additionally, we have embraced the call from Engineering Council for CPD to be integral and mandatory part of charterdom and we provide encouragement to continue the learning process and record CPD for said members, some using Eng Council's own My Career Path to do this. 50 years ago, I was 10. I knew what I wanted to do, just not what it was called. When I first sat at Gower Street, you had to sign a leather-bound book. Looking back through its pages, it was full of engineering greats. 
The UK is desperately short of engineers. We should all take this on board and inspire those behind us to solve this problem going forwards and make more grades. One step towards doing this is events such as our awards ceremony here this evening. It is unfortunate that we are unable to have this event in person, but it remains an honour to be able to say congratulations to every one of you receiving an award tonight. And now I hand back over to our CEO, Steph Smith. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so traditionally at our prizes and awards evenings, we always ask one of the award winners, uh, usually the winner of the Harold Hartley Medal, uh, to give a short technical presentation for you uh, on some of the work that they've done that's led, led to their award. Um, tonight we've asked for Professor Graham Machin from MPL to give us a short speech uh, as the winner of this year's Harold Hartley Medal. Unfortunately, he's not able to attend this evening, um, but he still has a very interesting presentation that he has pre-recorded for you all, uh, which I hope you will enjoy. Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to my talk. It's uh, a great honour uh, to be awarded the uh, Sir Harold Hartley Medal by the Institute of Measure and Control. I'm really sorry uh, not to be there this evening uh, and uh, I hope you have a nice evening. Um, I've been asked to give a short uh, 15 minute presentation just speaking about a few of the things uh, that I've done over the years with related to temperature measurement. So here is a, a career in thermometry in 15 minutes. I've really um, only touched on a few of the things that I've done over the time. Uh, just to say, I work at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. Uh, it was founded over 100 years ago. I wasn't there when it started, believe it or not. Uh, and we're responsible for ensuring that all physical quantities, mass, length, time, temperature and so forth are realised, disseminated and measured correctly across the UK. We are based in Teddington in uh, southwest London. And my role uh, is, is as head of temperature measurement is to make sure that all temperature measurements are done correctly throughout the UK and consistent with our trading partners. So it's a challenging job. So what, uh, what uh, I'm going to speak about tonight are, uh, are we right? Uh, are we doing right for? And net zero is one of those important things that uh, we are right for. Uh, I want to speak about redefining the Kelvin and the role that MPL had in redefining the Kelvin. And then I want to end by speaking about two uh, practical examples, COVID-19 and the difficulties of fever detection and really helping decommission, uh, our temperature measurement helps decommission U the UK's nuclear heritage. So are we right? It's really important, isn't it, that uh, measurements are right. And we do that through comparing the scales that we have. We don't give a second thought really to the reliability of measurements around the world. And yet reliable measurement is the foundation of science, the foundation of industry, the foundation of trade, the foundation of healthcare. In fact, reliable globally accepted measurements are in fact really touches all forms of human endeavour. Think of how difficult trade would be if the measurements uh, in one country were different from the measurements in another, either length ones or mass ones. Likewise, it's really important uh, that uh, measurements of temperature are the same across different places, different countries. Uh, and the only way to really test whether that's the case is to compare them at the very highest levels, that is compare them at the level of the National Measurement Institutes and determine what level of agreement actually is. The world's measurement system is probably the, the most globalised human endeavour uh, that uh, is actually happening. Uh, it covers nearly all the economic activity around the world and it's covered by the international system of units uh, which are used by almost every, uh, every nation around the world for measurement and for trade. So to compare the scales, I innovated uh, over time two different ways of comparing scales. Uh, one is using a non-contact thermometer. You can see here a picture of a non-contact thermometer. It detects the infrared radiation given off by uh, an object. You can see here a high temperature black body glowing. You can just about see here a non-contact thermometer being calibrated against a high temperature black body. 
So to compare a scale using a non-contact thermometer, you just calibrate a infrared thermometer like this uh, against a high temperature black body like this in your own laboratory. You then take the infrared thermometer like this, which is much easier to transport to the comparing laboratory and then compare the scales that, and, that they have with the one that you have on that instrument. I compared the scales of the United States uh, with the UK in the early 1990s uh, with the world's lowest uncertainty at the time. And you can see here really good agreement in the two different scales. And that's um, really a factor of three to five better than what had been done by previous approaches. We're not content with that. We developed a new approach using high temperature fixed points. I'll talk about those in a few moments time. Uh, and you can actually compare scales a factor of 10 poly better than you can with a non-contact thermometer. Here you can see a comparison at 2000 Kelvin or so with an uncertainty or a difference of less than uh, 0.2 Kelvin between the Chinese Institute, the Spanish Institute uh, and MPL ourselves. So again, this is really shows that the foundation of high temperature thermometry, and of course, this has been done for other aspects of thermometry as well, is really well established. And of course, is established for other units as well. But why do we want to be right? Well, we want to be right for all those other things like healthcare, meteorology, research, but also very practical things like contributing to net zero. And you contribute to net zero by optimizing temperature measurement. <clears throat> because in industry, many, many industrial processes are driven thermally. You can imagine steel production, you need to heat steel up to melt it. A chemical production, you need to heat them up to uh, make drive the reactions. Here is a turbine blade for power generation being heat treated. So thermal processing is a really important process in industry. But if into temperature measurement, controlling these processes done incorrectly, you use more energy than you need to. You generate scrap, which is not good, and you increase carbon emissions. And you can avoid all those things if you have optimized temperature measurement. The foundation of improving high temperature measurements has been uh, the development of high temperature fixed points, which um, um, our colleagues in Japan innovated and which I've been leading over the last uh, number of years. And these really are really important. Uh, they melt above the melting point of copper, which is about um, 1084 degrees Celsius, and they're repeatable to really low, low degree. You can see a repeatable at 0 0.02 degrees Celsius, even at two and a half thousand degrees Celsius. And high temperature fixed points have really been the foundation of improving high temperature measurement over the last decades, decade or so. You can see here the wide range of high temperature fixed points that there are. Uh, we've focused on cobalt carbon, platinum carbon, rhenium carbon, and tungsten, carb tungsten carbide carbon. You can see here just really how they work. You heat them up. They melt, you have a plateau in temperature, and then you can use this plateau in temperature for a range of purposes. Calibrating thermometers is a very important one. And we've been really working to develop what are known as self-calibrating thermocouples, self-calibrating temperature sensors at high temperatures, even above 2,200 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and we've got to the point where we've actually moved towards commercialization and a company in the UK, CCPI, based in Rotherham, is already performing industrial trials of self-validating sensors uh, across Europe and the US. And these have, a, have really the potential to really radically change um, high temperature measurements uh, going forward. Sensors in the past may have drifted one, five, 10 degrees or more, really causing problems with industrial process control. But here, by using self-validation, that issue will be a thing, will be a problem of the past. Right, let's move on uh, to something a bit more um, very high level in a research sense about redefining the Kelvin. And really, we've redefined the Kelvin? Yes, we've really redefined the Kelvin. And this has been a long marathon, more than 15 years of global research, uh, working towards the redefinition of the kilogram, the ampere, the Kelvin, and the mole in terms of fundamental constants. The firing gun was fired 
in 2005 by the International Committee for Weights and Measures. You can see here on this slide, so on this slide, the various ways in which the, in the units are redefined. The meter is now defined in terms of the speed of light. It was like, defined like that before, since 1983, but since um, May 2019, the kilogram has been defined in terms of Planck's constant, the ampere in terms of the electronic charge, the Kelvin in terms of a fixed value of the Boltzmann constant, and the mole in terms of the Avogadro constant. <clears throat> so a, a really big change uh, in the SI in the 20th of May 2019. In the past, uh, for a very long time, since the 1950s, the Kelvin was defined in terms of triple point of water, where water vapour, ice and liquid water existed in an evacuated vessel. And you can see here uh, a section of a, water, a picture of a, a water triple point. Here is Lord Kelvin. Uh, and that has been replaced with a fixed value of the Boltzmann constant. You can see the value here. MPL contributed really significantly to these final two values. Here's uh, Ludwig Boltzmann. Uh, and this is the now the definition of the Kelvin uh, in the SI brochure going forward. MPL used acoustic gas thermometry measuring the speed of sound in argon in this beautiful piece of apparatus to make one of the world's lowest uncertainty evaluations of the Boltzmann constant for that redefinition. And this is what the value is now in the, in the new uh, system of units. And that new system now uh, is enduring. Uh, the, the definitions won't be changed for the foreseeable future. If you're interested, you can go to the BIPM website and get much more information there. And if you're interested in the Kelvin redefinition itself, you can always read my paper here. So what about fever screening? So let's talk about some practical things uh, at the end of my talk. Um, I hope you'll agree that body temperature measurement is fundamental for assessing human health, especially when you're trying to detect fever, either to stop the spread of infection during pandemics, or really to build a score for diagnosis and assigning treatment pathways for sepsis, or immunocompromised patients, for instance. But, you know, measuring temp body temperature is actually very difficult and it's not done very well in public health settings. And the reason why that is, is because this little device here, which people of a certain age will be very familiar with, a mercury and glass clinical thermometer, has been superseded by this wide range of devices. And the question is, are they equivalent? Are they equivalent? Well, unfortunately, they're not. And in particular, non-contact thermometers, the published evidence seems to indicate that the performance of these devices is both poor or very poor. Forehead thermometers, skin, that is wrist thermometers, typically have uncertainties of one to more than several degrees Celsius, which is completely inappropriate for detecting fevers for health screening and for patient triage. The thermal images similarly have similar uncertainties. At the height of the pandemic, the MHRA, our, our regulator for health devices, uh, basically put out a news, a news flash saying, don't rely on temperature screening products for detecting coronavirus. And if you do, if you sell them for that purpose, we might sue you for doing uh, such thing, for being selling a misleading product. So that was a really fierce thing. But we've got to solve this problem uh, for uh, getting ready for any possible future pandemic. Um, it's really important because Measuring temperature was really the only way of uh, trying to spread, stop the spread of the fever before testing was available. And we need to act now to solve this problem uh, before any possible pandemic arises in the future. But also, we also need to improve routine body temperature measurements to really uh, help improve uh, or reduce avoidable deaths, eke out those antibiotics that we have, uh, and to make sure that appropriate treatment pathways are given to patients. You know, one healthcare worker said to me recently that because of the difficulty in measuring temperature is not generally even worth taking, which is a crying shame and, and, it, uh, and can be solved. So I've helped establish the UK Body Temperature Measurement Group. I lead a global group on improving body temperature measurement around the world. I've been working to inform medics and policymakers about this issue. Uh, it is possible to reinstate reliable body temperature measurements and uh, my talk talks about this and you can get go to this link and watch a bigger talk I've given on body temperature measurement or you can read my paper in uh, the Journal of Medical Engineering Technology 
which was just, we just published a few months ago. And then finally, just, uh, just to say <clears throat> that uh, we're also working on helping decommission the UK's nuclear heritage. You know, the UK has got a proud and long-standing nuclear heritage. We had the world's first commercial nuclear power station, but much of that early, early uh, infrastructure has come to the end of its uh, useful life and needs safe decommissioning and storage. Currently, it's costing around three billion pounds a year uh, to do this, uh, and reliable measurement is required to make sure this is done safely and effectively. And in fact, reliable temperature measurement is often required for this, for storing uh, and monitoring the health of containers that are holding the material, for monitoring the environment inside stores, for monitoring the temperature of spent fuel ponds as well to make sure they're under close control. And I've written a paper recently in Nuclear Engineering and Design which talks about some of our developments. But in brief, you can see here how we're developing, um, <clears throat> this is just one aspect of developing reliable temperature measurement for special nuclear material containers in store. There's more than 40,000 of these containers. We're developing novel reliable measures, measurement methods for intermediate level waste containers. And again, there'll be more than 40,000 of these uh, by the time we finish decommissioning our facilities. And here we're developing a, a reliable way of measuring the surface temperature of the racks that hold the spent fuel in ponds. And again, there's going to be a lot of this spent fuel in ponds for decades uh, before a long term repository is built. So these are very important measurements uh, for nuclear decommissioning. So um, I've really spoken about the great efforts we're making to make sure temperature measurement is reliable around the world. In fact, all measurements are reliable around the world. It's really essential to have reliable temperature measurement uh, for a wide range of human endeavour, health care, meteorology, but of course industry is the example I gave. I've talked about the contributions we've made for um, uh, the leading contribution made to the Kelvin redefinition. And also I've just ended with a couple of practical examples of contemporary temperature measurement challenges. You know, there's so much more to do uh, and uh, I'm, I'm envious of my uh, younger colleagues at NPL who have got so much, so much, uh, a very interesting career of many interesting things to do for the decades to come. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, I'm really honored to receive the Sir Harold Hartley Medal of the Institute of Measurement Control. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for very much for that. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. Good night. I hope you all found that found that very interesting. And as always, Graeme does give a very interesting presentation about the things that he's been working on. I know he's disappointed he wasn't able to attend this evening and ask questions, but I'm sure that if any of you do have any follow up questions um, from that presentation, yeah, he'd be very happy to hear from you or if you'd like to send them through to the office, we'll, we'll pass them on and I'm sure he'll provide provide answers to all of you. Um, so for the next part of the evening, I'm going to pass back over to Ken Grattan, the chair of the Prizes and Awards Committee, who is going to go through and read the citations for this year's winners. And I think we've got the opportunity for the winners, most of whom have joined us tonight, uh, which is wonderful. Um, hopefully they're going to have a few seconds to, to say a few words after, after Ken reads out the citations. So thank you, Ken, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Steph. Um, as you say, um, this, uh, we, we come an eye to the uh, crowning moment of the, of the evening, and that is the, the awards themselves. Um, the full citations for the awards are available online. I'm not going to read them out on full for each recipient, but I'll just give a brief summary of uh, the reason for the award. So let me start with, uh, with Graham Mason. Um, as you have heard, He's the winner of the uh, Sir Harold Hartley uh, Medal, uh, and the uh, Hartley Medal is awarded for an outstanding contribution to the technology of measurement and control. And uh, in summary, uh, the citation uh, is as follows. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have seen the work that he did in, his, in, in the lecture, but it's for the key achievements over many years, uh, which include leading two major international consortia uh, through the implementing of the, the new Kelvin project. Um, at this time of the redefinition of the SI, um, the work that uh, Graham has done with his colleagues have made a seminal contribution to the Kelvin redefinition, 
through stimulation of resurgence in primary thermometry, uh, performing multiple measurements of the thermodynamic fitness of both current temperature scales and making uh, major contributions to um, mise en pratique uh, for the definition of the Kelvin. So uh, again, uh, you'll have uh, seen, seen the work in, in the lecture. Um, let me offer uh, congratulations again on behalf of the Institute to uh, Professor Graham Mason uh, for the work that he's done. And uh, as you know, he's not able to be with us, but we will make sure we pass on the uh, award to him in due course. So we come directly then to the next uh, award, and that is the Honeywell International Medal. And the winner of the Honeywell International Medal this year is uh, Dr. David uh, Angeli. And the Honeywell Medal uh, is awarded for distinguished work in control by a chartered measurement and control technologist. Uh, and the citation for the award is summarized as follows. Uh, the research focus that has led to the award of the Honeywell Medal was based on the stability, performance and control of nonlinear systems. Uh, and in particular, Dr. Angeli has made major contributions to several fields, and these are quite diverse fields, so I think uh, you can see just uh, the wide range uh, in the work that we've done. From economic model predictive control, to defining and extending the input to state stability framework for analyzing nonlinear systems of various kinds, to the qualitative behavior of differential equation models and networks of chemical interactions, to monotone control systems as they arise in systems biology and on distributed solutions for demand side measurement and energy storage in smart grids. So again, our congratulations uh, to Dr. David Angeli for the Honeywell International Medal. OK, thanks a lot uh, for your kind consideration. I would like definitely to thank the, the panel and the chair for their kind consideration and definitely very pleased and honored to receive this important award. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it brings us to the, uh, the next medal, and that is the Calendar Medal. And the Calendar Medal is given for an outstanding contribution to the art of instruments or measurement. And the winners of the Calendar Medal are, are Professor Adrian Long and Professor Mohammed Bashir. So let me briefly summarize the citation. Uh, the Calendar Medal has been awarded to a distinguished team of civil engineers uh, for their joint development and invention of instrumentation uh, to support uh, new types of non-destructive measurement for in the field use in the structural engineering industry. Uh, they made a major contribution over many years and their work uh, across those years is exemplified in the autoclam permeability instrument, which was developed by Long and Bashir and commercialized by them uh, to allow for the first time quantitative measurements of those surface properties of concrete influencing its durability and performance in normal or aggressive environments. So uh, our congratulations to the calendar uh, medalists uh, of uh, this year, uh, Professor Adrian Long and Professor Mohammed Bashir. Uh, Bashir. Thank you. Th thank you, Ken. Um, I just thought of actually saying um, a great thanks to um, the award committee for selecting both Sir Professor Long and me for this award. And also I would like to thank uh, people who supported us, um, Jim Newell, Alistair Thompson, Norman Harmon, uh, Kai Yang, and uh, Sri Jitnan Kutan. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Bashir, and congratulations. The next award is the Finkelstein Medal, uh, named after Professor Ludwig Finkelstein, a past president of the Institute of Measurement and Control. And the Finkelstein Medal is given for notable contributions to measurement uh, internationally, uh, and it can be awarded to either a UK or an international figure. 
And the winner this year is uh, Professor Frank Hartig. And the citation reads as follows. Uh, this year, the award has been made to recognize the contribution of uh, Professor Frank Hartig through his international leadership in the field of measurement, uh, including leadership of the contribution from uh, PTB, which is the uh, German National Standards Laboratory, uh, to the development of new standards for the kilogram and the PTB work uh, has been using the silicon sphere approach. Um, Professor Partick is uh, highly international in his outlook. In 2018, he became uh, president-elect of IMECO, the International Measurement Confederation. And uh, in the last uh, month or so, uh, he was elected president of this international body. And of course, it's a body of where the Institute of Measurement and Control is the UK member organization amongst, I think, 40 odd uh, uh, members internationally. Uh, Professor Hartig is also um, planning to host the uh, IMECO um, World Congress uh, in 2024 in Berlin. So uh, our congratulations go to uh, Professor Frank Hartig uh, for the award of the Finkelstein Medal. And uh, over to you. Uh, Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Frank, uh, good okay, to hear. Thank you very much, Professor Gretton. Dear honorable representatives of the Institute of Measurement and Control, dear members of the Institute's Prizes and Awards Committee, it was a great surprise and still it is a great honor for me to receive the Finkelstein Medal from your famous institute. This is especially true in my function, as Professor Gretton said, uh, as president of the International Measurement Confederation, the IMECO, that deals with 42 member organizations distributed all over the globe in order to interchange scientific information among scientists and engineers from research and industry. The Finkelstein Medal will also influence my work as vice president of the German Metrological Institute, the PDB. Together with many colleagues, it is one of my tasks to realize not only the unit kilogram, as well all other units of the international system and to harmonize metrology and measurement within our country, but also with partners all over the world. For me, the Finkelstein Medal is a strong motivation to support metrology on an international level and to bring together scientists and industry representatives worldwide in order to exchange new techniques and measurement processes. With this, I would like to thank you once again for your confidence in my work. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your speech. That brings us to the next award, and this is a, a new award uh, which has been made uh, with the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers of London and it commemorates the work of Dr. Derek Cornish, who is both a past president of the Institute and master of the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. So the Cornish Medal uh, is awarded to an individual or to a group or to a company that has excelled in some dimension of scientific instrument making. Uh, for example, uh, where the award can be made to those from industry, academia, or national and independent uh, laboratories. And so there's a, a, a wide range of uh, possibilities in our new Cornish award. And I'm delighted to say that the award has been given to a, a, a team, uh, an industry academic team, uh, linking uh, Sydney Water and uh, City University. Uh, and uh, the citation for the award is as follows. Uh, the award is given to recognize the work of this international academic stroke industry team in developing a fiber brag grating based optical fiber sensor system which was tailored designed for uh, client use in the field in remote locations to measure both relative humidity and temperature in real-time hazardous sewer and biodigester environments and to provide alerts to end users using 4G and 5G connections. And uh, I'm delighted that uh, uh, our colleagues from uh, Australia 
uh, are with us. Uh, it's very early in the morning in, in, in Sydney. So uh, uh, thank you very much for, for being with us, uh, even though it's, it's rather early. Um, and the, the, for, from, from Sydney, we have um, uh, Herberto Bustamante and Luisa Voracher. And uh, receiving the awards on behalf of the, of the team from, from City is uh, Dr. Mildrag Vidakovic, uh, who uh, represents the, the, the team tonight. Uh, so I think perhaps, uh, Mio, do you want to, uh, um, just on behalf of the team, just say a few words? Yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. And thank you very much to the Institute and uh, Washable Company of Scientific Instrument Makers for recognizing our work as a team. And just to emphasize really here, it really comes down to the teamwork between Sydney Water colleagues who are assisting us with the challenges that they are facing in a real time world. And us from City University, my colleagues, Professor Ken Grattan, Professor Tong San, and Dr. Matthias Fabian, who are working hard on the latest development of optical fiber sensors to mm -hmm. tackle those challenges. Thank you very much again, and it's my great honor and privilege to receive such a award. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, just as we, as we have uh, our, our colleague, um, uh, I think perhaps Harry Bustamante from, uh, from Sydney uh, with us, uh, I was wondering, do you want to would you like uh, Harry to, just to say a word or two uh, uh, as as you've joined us from from Sydney? Oh yeah, yes, Ken. Thank, thank you very much. Oh, it, it is it is an honor to participate in this in this uh, <coughs> ceremony uh, and receive the award for the collaboration between Sydney Water and uh, City University. Sydney Water is one of the largest uh, water utilities in, in Australia. And this award is a recognition to the highly beneficial collaboration between Sydney Water and that we have had with professors Grattan and Sun at, uh, at City University. Uh, the collaboration with City has continued and has broadened to tackling other, to tackling and solving other issues in the infrastructure and also in water and wastewater treatment processes. I would like also to highly commend City University because of their understanding of both industry needs and drivers and the need to develop solutions that, that can be implemented in industrial practice. And this has been remarkable. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Harry, for your, your comments. Um, let me move on then to the to, to the next uh, award, and that is the LB Lambert Award. And the Lambert Award is an award given particularly for, for service to the Institute, uh, and indeed emphasizes the meritorious service that's been done through involvement with local sections. Um, this is another international award. It goes to uh, Professor Eddie Locke. Um, and um, Eddie Locke is a, uh, uh, actively involved in the Hong Kong local section of the Institute. And the award is given to recognize all of the work that Professor Locke has done during his time as vice chairman of the Hong Kong local section. Uh, in particular, um, uh, it's important to note that there was a substantial increase in the membership uh, and an increase in the members gaining professional registration uh, in Hong Kong and uh, Eddie has done a considerable amount of work to build the Institute's presence and reputation in Hong Kong over many years. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, the uh, LB Lambert Award then goes to Professor Eddie Locke this year. I, I think, is he, he's not joining us, Steph? Uh, it's um, now very, very late in Hong Kong, so I think Eddie's not able to join us this evening. OK, thank you. Now, this brings us to the uh, the last section in, in our awards tonight, and that is the Award of Honorary Fellow. Uh, the Award of Honorary Fellow is uh, given uh, recognised distinguished and normally uh, long and meritorious service to the Institute. And we have two awards of honorary fellow this evening. The first of these goes to uh, John Morley. 
Uh, John has been actively involved with the Institute since 1981 and has been a past president uh, of the Institute as well. Uh, he's been an active member both in the central office of the Institute and in particular in the London section as well. Uh, and uh, so has some 40 years service in that respect. Uh, within the London section, he was elected as chairman for two years in the 1990s and has remained active on the committee since then. And from his time as London chairman, uh, in addition, as I said, to being past president, over a period of something like 15 years, he served on the major institute committees, commencing with the local sections committee and serving it as his chairman. So for distinguished and long meritorious service to the Institute, uh, it's our pleasure to award honorary fellowship to John Morley. John, over to you. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, really, I've got to thank uh, a number of uh, people who because of the very difficult way that I managed to become president in that having failed the 11 plus, but being given um, uh, as a student apprenticeship with ICI made, a, made a, an incredible difference, which meant that going on to HNDs and all the rest of it, finally doing institute exams with the IERE, who merged with the INSTEM-C, so um, looking back and um, being 40 years on the London committee, um, the colleagues and the people that I've met have made it all worthwhile. And I would recommend that people get involved with the local committees because the camaraderie is absolutely superb. Um, uh, just one thing in that with the awards, and although I appreciate the wonderful things people are doing, um, I do sometimes feel that the local sections depend on actually people out there in the field doing physical work and practical work. And I really would like to see somehow some of those being recognised for maybe commissioning large systems, um, uh, whether it be in, in the nuclear field. I mean, oil and gas, unfortunately, is likely to, to uh, um, uh, disappear. But um, I would like to see more low, uh, practical people being awarded. But thank you very much for the award. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you very much. And congratulations again. Um, our second honorary fellowship, uh, again, uh, same citation, recognizing distinguished and normally long and meritorious service to the Institute, goes to uh, Professor Ron Summers. Uh, and Ron, uh, again, has offered very considerable service to the Institute over very many years. Um, he served for a number of years, uh, from 2000 to 2005, as its vice president and um, was its first two-term president for, for many years, uh, serving in 2007 and 2008. Uh, and at that, at that time, undertaking what was an unusual uh, second year as president and supporting the Institute at that time. Uh, he has uh, for a number of years been a member of the Institute Board of Trustees uh, and has served as chair of the Institute uh, Communications Board and as well as editor of the Journal of Measurement and Control. Further, he's been very active in the Institute's contribution to IMECO, uh, the Int International Measurement Confederation, and has served as chair of uh, its uh, technical committee in biomedical measurement uh, for many years. So on the basis of that uh, extensive and uh, distinguished uh, um, summary of, of some of some of Ron's activity, not all of it, but some of Ron's activity, then that uh, we're delighted that uh, he's accepted the award of honorary fellow. And uh, congratulations, Ron. And uh, we invite you to uh, say a few words. Good evening, everybody. Um, being aware of uh, past recipients of this award, I'm both honored and humbled to receive it myself. 
Well, I am aware that it's awarded for individual service. It would be remiss of me not to acknowledge and indeed thank um, past and present members of City University, my alma mater. Of the past masters, uh, sorry, of the past members, uh, I need to point out to uh, the, the late, great Ludwig Finkelstein, who fired me with the initial enthusiasm to take part in the life of the Institute and latterly of IMECO. But I wish to take this opportunity to thank you all for, for this award. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron, and uh, congratulations again. Um, so that brings me to the end of the uh, of the reading out of the awards for, for the evening. Uh, again, uh, thank uh, everyone for um, uh, comments that they've made. Uh, congratulations again to, to everyone for uh, uh, the awards that they've been given. And I'll hand back over to the Institute CEO, to Steph Smith, to round the evening off. Thank you, Ken. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you very much for everybody for coming um, and congratulations again to all the award winners. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that we would really love for you to join us next year at our physical prizes and awards committee. All of this year's are winners and last year's. Please do join us at Prince Philip House in October next year. We'll send you invitations. Come and collect your medals. Um, have a drink on the Institute. Uh, we, we'd love to see you. We're sorry we couldn't see you this year. Um, but very well done for all of the awards. Thank you to everyone who joined us this evening to, to celebrate our award winners. And we'd very much hope to see you next year. Have a have a nice night. Thank you very much.